Please take your Bibles and turn to that passage of Scripture that I read just a few moments ago, Exodus chapter 12, looking today at part 4 of the plague of the death of the firstborn, or as it was entitled, Listen Carefully or Die. God was very, very explicit on this last plague. The previous plagues had been kept from the land of Goshen. God's people had been protected. But on this last plague, everyone, Egyptians and Jews, had to come under the blood or they would have to die. Last week was Thanksgiving Sunday. And although we were not in the season for Passover, truly Passover is the season of thanksgiving for Israel. God delivered them from the oppressing nation of Egypt to worship him in freedom. God delivered our forefathers here in America to worship him in freedom without the oppression of the state church. So in a real sense, our study of Passover on Thanksgiving Sunday was very appropriate. A reminder to give thanks to God who has given us our freedoms here in the United States. Freedoms which daily seem to be crumbling away and disappearing into the ocean that's raging around us until finally it will eventually affect us here. You recall that we saw that God used this tenth plague to teach substitutionary redemption. If Israel failed to obey the Passover, their firstborn children and animals would have also have died in the plague. You recall that Passover is a permanent, perpetual feast for Israel because it speaks of the eternal, permanent sacrifice of Christ once and for all, never to be repeated again, which is why the Roman Catholic Mass is a blasphemy because they claim that Christ is being re-sacrificed over and over and over and over again every time the priest elevates the host and says in the words of the Mass, we offer unto the only true and living God. At that moment, the Catholic Church teaches that the host, that is, the wafer and the wine, become the body and blood of Christ. Of the same in appearance, but transubstantiated in their real substance. But that's a blasphemy. Christ was sacrificed once for sin, forever. The book of Hebrews says it over and over and over again. Last week, we also tried to put Passover into its context. God gave seven feasts to Israel, and we saw Passover in the context of the seven feasts explained in their New Testament fulfillment. We saw that the lamb was to be observed for three days to make sure that it was perfect and without defect. And Jesus was carefully examined and observed during his three years of ministry on earth and was pronounced not guilty. Even upon examination by Pontius Pilate, the Gentile ruler, I find no fault in him. John 19.6. John the Baptist had already declared him to be the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world in John 1.29. Immediately after the Passover, we saw was the seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread. And you probably noticed in our text today, as we read it all the way through verse 20, that the majority of the passage is talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. How many verses are given to that, especially as you get down to the end of the passage, where it emphasizes that if you eat leaven during that feast, you're to be cut off from Israel. That is, if you are a Jew. Unleavened bread, because leaven is a picture and a type of, of sin. We saw that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 13. The next thing we learned last week was that Jesus, the God-man, was without sin, although he bore our sins. And because he was without sin, he could be the perfect sacrifice for us. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did but beseech you by us. We pray you, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Verse 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the doctrine of imputation, and we've talked a great deal to retail in the past about imputation versus justification, propitiation, reconciliation, remission, all the massive doctrines of the cross. All the incredible things that Jesus accomplished for us on Calvary's cross. In Hebrews 4, 15 and 9, 28. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, 
yet without sin. The temptation is not the sin, the temptation is the attack. Yes, Satan tempted Jesus, Matthew chapter 4, you know it. And yet he did not yield. He answered every time with the word of God. He said, it is written. And that's the way that you and I are to deal with temptation as well. When the temptation comes, we say, it is written. And we go to scripture. And we quote scripture. That's why it's important to memorize scripture. That's why it's important to meditate on scripture. That's why it's important to know your Bible. Because you will be faced with temptations. And Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. You're never going to be hit with a unique temptation. But such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it? Do you know the way of escape? You will, will not know the way of escape unless you know the word of God. The way you answer temptation is with the scripture. That's what Jesus did. He set the example for us. If you do not know your Bible, you will not be able to resist the temptation. The way of escape that God has made for you is not some kind of a miracle door in the wall over there where you suddenly run through it. God has given you the word of God. That is the sword of the spirit with which you are able to defeat the enemy. You have lots of protective armor. You have only one offensive weapon. It's the word of God, the sword of the spirit. Do you know it? If I asked you for a summary of the book of Ecclesiastes, could you give it to me? If I asked you for a summary of the book of Hosea, could you give it to me? If I asked you for a summary of the book of Zechariah, could you give it to me? Do you know what's in the chapters of each of those books? There are 150 psalms. Do you know what's in each of the 150 psalms? Do you know which ones are messianic psalms? Do you want to know which ones are prophetic of his first coming? Do you know which ones are prophetic of his second coming? Dear people, do you know your word? This is your sword! Hebrews 9, 28, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He was made to be sin for us, but he himself was without sin. And that's why he can be the perfect substitutionary sacrifice for your sin and for mine. And then we looked at that third feast, the feast of first fruits. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel. This is about the end of the harvest and the things that are coming at the end of the harvest. And it says, He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. That is, on a Sunday. The first fruit falls during Passover, and it specifically foreshadows the resurrection of Christ. We are told that specifically in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the great resurrection chapter of the New Testament. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made of life. And then he says it again, verse 23. But every man in his own order, Christ, the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ's and his coming. Those three feasts, the feast of Passover, the feast of unleavened bread, the feast of first fruits, give a foreshadowing of the gospel in Romans chapter 1 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The gospel, the key issues, who Jesus is, what Jesus did. Jesus is the final Passover of God's angel of death. And all those who place their faith in him have eternal life instead of eternal death in hell. Which is not cessation of existence, it's conscious torment for eternity. And Paul explains it in 1 Corinthians 1 through 4 and Romans chapter 1, 1 through 4. And then last week we also began a study on the symbolism of the other elements in the Passover meal that God gave in addition to the lamb and the way that the Jews today celebrate the Passover. The first thing we talked about last week was the four cups at the Passover Seder, the Passover sitting. When the Jews today sit around the Passover table to partake of the Passover, what do they do? And how does it parallel what Jesus did at the Lord's Supper, the, the Last Supper, in the upper room. And we saw that those same four cups are present in the upper room as Jesus was there with his disciples. We looked at the Haggadah, that's the Passover book that contains the Seder order of service. And we saw that observant Jews hold a memorial every year just like Christians do when we celebrate the resurrection. For Jews, Passover and their deliverance from Egyptian bondage is just as significant to them as Christians who have allowed who have seen, who have received the Lord Jesus Christ who rose from the dead for them. We've been delivered from the power of the devil by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18 tell us that specifically. 
ultra-Orthodox, Orthodox, and conservative Jews, and even a few of the Reformed Jews, spend days cleaning their house to make sure that there's no leaven in the house, taking you back to that Feast of Unleavened Bread. They go through the house with a little, uh, a little feather and a, a little dustpan and they, uh, or a little spoon, and they try to scrape up all the little crumbs that might have leaven in them. They let the children do that and always leave a few cracker crumbs around so the kids can sweep up those crumbs. They bring out special dishes, special silverware, only used at Passover, beautiful candles, beautiful table settings. There'll be matzo ball soup. That's chicken soup with matzo balls and special spices. The felt the fish, which you do not want to eat. <laughs> I've had it uh, on a bed of lettuce. Other things mentioned in our text today. The Jews hold a, a meal called a Seder. It lasts for hours. The full holiday, including the Feast of Unleavened Bread, lasts for eight days with a Seder on the first and the last uh, second nights. That means the order of service. They don't make it up as they go along. They follow a specific ritual. So each family member who is able reads and follows along in the Haggadah, the book that's used at the Seder service. Then they have the four cups because the four cups remind them of the four great promises in Exodus chapter 6. Number one, I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. Number two, I will rescue you from their bondage. These are the specific things listed in verses 6 and 7. Number three, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Number four, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. They've never forgotten that. The Exodus happened over 3,400 years ago. And they have not forgotten that God made them a promise. And they are looking for the fulfillment of that promise. They don't know it has been fulfilled in Christ. And so they still look for those four great promises in Exodus chapter 6. The four cups acknowledge that God kept his promise and delivered his people, the Jews, from slavery in Egypt. And when all four are put together at Passover, they provide a step-by-step -step memorial of that great past event. But as we have seen, they also provide a reminder and an anticipation of one event yet to come when God takes Israel, the nation of Israel, to be his people. That last phrase of verse 7, and I will be your God. We saw that the first cup was the cup of sanctification. By that cup, the Jews acknowledge and remember that God selected chose them, set them apart for his own by giving them the Ten Commandments and the law. And the father or the grandfather will offer a prayer of praise before that cup is drunk. The second cup is known as the cup of praise. That is drunk after the reading the story of the Exodus, which to the Jews is the ultimate account of liberation from slavery. And then the father or grandfather will then offer a prayer of praise to God for keeping his promise to deliver the remnant of the Jews in every generation of Jewish history. And we listed all the countries which they list during that time and those who have come from other countries where there has been a pogrom or a persecution list others. But they always list Egypt and Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Assyria and Rome. Many of them list also the Russian pogroms, the Polish pogroms, the Spanish Inquisition, deliverance from Hitler and Mussolini in the Holocaust. The third cup is the cup of redemption. It's drunk after the meal is ended and after the Afikoman is found. I'm going to talk about the Afikoman today. But that third cup, the ancient biblical world redemption, is the term used to speak of slaves being purchased and then set free. God purchased Israel and their firstborn by providing a substitutionary redemption lamb so that the firstborn would not be killed. The lamb gave its life so that the family under the blood might live. At the first Passover, God not only freed the Jews from physical slavery to Pharaoh, but also freed them from the gods of Egypt and the filthy practices of that pagan culture. The third cup has particular significance for us as Christians because it's the third cup that Jesus took after the supper in Luke 22, 19 through 20. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body which is given unto you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also this cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. That's why the Apostle Paul, a highly trained Jewish scholar, but an apostle to the Gentiles, 
wrote to the Gentile Corinthians so that they would understand the connection between Christ, the Passover, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's why he writes in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 6 and following, Your glorying is not good, know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth out the whole lump. There we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened for even Christ our Passover. There you have the Passover, his sacrifice for us. Therefore let us not keep the feast. There you have the feasts. Not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And then we saw last week the fourth cup is called the cup of acceptance or the cup of anticipation. It's the one that has not yet been fulfilled. That cup symbolizes the relationship that God has promised in the future with his people Israel when all Israel shall be saved. As Paul explains in Romans chapter 11, there's coming a day when every living Jew who has made it through the great tribulation, when every living Jew still alive on the face of the earth will realize they are lost without their Messiah. For two days they will repent. Hosea tells us that. And then on the third day, the entire nation will turn to Christ. He will cry out for him to come and redeem them, and he will that the second coming end of the tribulation period comes back and delivers Israel and establishes his kingdom. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Verse 26, So shall all Israel be saved. As it is written, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. That's the cup that Jesus uses to symbolize the ratification of the new covenant and to institute what we call the communion service. Jesus had already drunk three cups with his disciples up to this point. But it's interesting to note that he does not appear to have drunk that fourth cup when he gave it to his disciples. Look at the way the text is phrased. Instead, he says he will drink it with them when the messianic kingdom is established. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. All four of those cups are still a part of the Passover Seder, practiced by every observant Jew and every Jewish home today, even though their eyes are blinded to the fact that they speak of Christ, God's Passover lamb. Remember what I just read a moment ago? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, Romans 11:25, lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. There are still Jews being saved today, blindness only in part. But the day is coming when all Israel shall be saved. When God shall turn their hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. And draw them. Irresistibly draw them to himself. Do you pray for that? Do you pray for Israel? They are a cup of trembling, the scripture says. The nations are amassed against them. They're currently depending on their own strength, their own power, their own military might, their own wisdom, their own skill, their, own, their gifts that God has given to them, brilliance. But they will come when they can no longer rely on themselves. They must cry for their Messiah to deliver them. Dear people, this is what's going on in Exodus chapter 12, our text. This is the Passover, God's instituting it so that Israel would know that the Messiah is coming. Now that we've looked at the four cups, let's look at the four questions. We are beginning new material at this point. Four questions that are asked during the Haggadah service. Remember something. This Jewish holiday is designed to teach the children of the next generation so that they will never forget. Israel understands that principle. Christians do not. Whenever a young man is inducted, or a young woman, into the Israeli military, they go to the top of Masada for their induction ceremony. 
It was there at Masada that the Romans surrounded about 900 Jews. Masada was a palace built by Herod the Great, right off the edge of the Dead Sea, massive high buttress, fortifications at the top. The Jews held out day after day, month after month, year after year. The Romans built their camps all around so no one could escape. But the Romans couldn't get in. And finally, they began to build a ramp. You can still see all of this today if you go to Masada. I've been there. You can stand at the top and you can still see the, the stone outlines of the Roman camps that were built around the foot of this gigantic flat-topped mountain. You can still see the ramp the Romans built with buckets full of dirt and stone as the Roman soldiers lugged it and dumped it. Went back and got more, lugged it and dumped it. Went back and got more, lugged it and dumped it. Until this massive earthwork ramp was built up against the walls of Masada. And they moved their battering rams up the ramp. And the night before Masada fell, the Jewish leader gathered the men together. And he said to them, if you see your wives and children dragged in chains to Rome, while the Romans torture and mutilate you, would you see your wives and children raped by the Roman soldiers? And he called for lots, and they drew their lots. And as each man drew his lots, it fell to them to be the last two, one would kill the other. All others would kill their own wives and children. And the last one would fall on his sword and kill himself. But he said to them, don't destroy our provisions, let them see that we had more than enough food and water. We could have held out indefinitely. Josephus records it for us. There were two women that hid in one of the cisterns. And they told the story of that last night. And so when the Romans came in, they came in not to victory, but into dead silence. the young Jewish troops who stand there and take their oath of allegiance to Israel shout together, Never again, Masada! But dear friends, there's a day coming when they must cry out for the Deliverer, for the Messiah, for the Passover Lamb. Because otherwise, there is only death. That's the final and tenth plague that we're looking at. God commanded Israel to teach these things to their sons and to their sons' sons forever. We as Christians should learn much from this. Because it is the obligation then of the youngest child present at the Passover Seder, the children are involved. It is a worship service, a family worship service. It is given to the fathers and the grandfathers the responsibility, and if they are dead, to the oldest brother. And if the brothers are dead, to the uncle. Yes, it is an obligation to teach the children. And so the youngest child asked the famous four questions to the Seder leader. The first question, why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat either leavened bread or matzo. But on this light night, we eat only matzo. Question two, on all other nights, we eat vegetables and herbs of all kinds. Why on this night do we eat bitter herbs especially? Question three, 
On all other nights, we never think of dipping even once. Why, on this night, do we dip twice? Question number four. On all other nights, everyone sits up straight at the table. Why, on this night, do we all recline? Do you remember the Lord's table? Do you remember that last supper? That Passover with Jesus and his disciples? Why on this night do we all recline? As the leader recites the plagues one by one, everybody dips his little finger into his cup and places a drop of juice or wine on his plate. This is a mnemonic device. When the recitation of the ten plagues is all over, the ten spots on each plate becomes an object lesson of the ten plagues. There are many items to taste at the Passover table to help the Jewish people remember their heritage, to pass it on to the next generation. Parsley is dipped in salt water, symbolizing the tears shed as slaves. Horseradish is placed on the matzah to remind them of the bitterness that Israel endured. Eating haruset which is a mixture of apples and nuts and honey and a little cinnamon, is a treat that reminds them of the sweetness of freedom when Pharaoh finally let God's people go. Since Malachi 4.5 prophesies that Elijah the prophet will announce the coming of Messiah, a special place is set at the Seder table for Elijah with a special glass of wine or of grape juice. In the middle of the ceremonies, and I'll talk about this later, a child is sent to the door to look and see if Elijah has come. Because Malachi prophesied, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of that great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. We'll speak more of that in a moment, the Lord willing. Very interestingly, only a shank bone of a lamb is present on the Seder plate. To remind them that when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, ending the sacrifices of lambs on Passover, today Orthodox rabbis will kill a chicken, slit its throat, and swing it around their heads over the congregation to sprinkle the blood of a chicken over the congregation. When I lived in Israel, I had a dear friend, a Jewish young man who was one of my Ulfan teachers, that is one of the teachers who taught us to speak modern Hebrew. He and I became very close friends and we spent many hours, many times, late until the night talking about the Old Testament prophecies of Jesus, the Messiah. How I yearn for him. His name is Arik Friedman. His wife is Jane, a British Jew. I was invited to the home of Jane's mother with Arik for a Passover meal. Astounding that a Gentile would be invited to such a thing. I played hymns on their piano and sang about Jesus. How I yearned for their salvation. I would begin to talk to Arik about a messianic passage and he could quote it to me in Hebrew from memory. He had been studying to be a rabbi until one day at a Passover service at his synagogue when the rabbi was sprinkling chicken blood he suddenly realized I'm a Jew For my sins to be forgiven, there has to be the blood of a lamb. We've not had a lamb sacrificed in 2,000 years. As God required at the temple. And so he concluded, either the Old Testament is a myth, and so why am I training to be a rabbi? Or the Old Testament is true, 
and we are without hope. So why am I training to be a rabbi? And so he left his rabbinic studies, though he had much of the Old Testament memorized. He went to the university to study psychology to explain away all religious experience by psychological problems. I pray for him every day. I pray for others of my Wilpon teachers every day. Pray for professors that I had at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem every day. I pray that I'll see them in heaven, that God will open their eyes with the scriptures which they know. For indeed, it is only the blood of a lamb, the Lamb of God, that can save them. The highlight of the evening of the Passover Seder, for the children at least, is the search for the Afikoman. Early in the evening, the Seder leader hides a wrapped piece of matzah. At the end of the meal, all the children are dismissed to try to find it, and whichever child finds the Afikoman can then redeem it for a price, usually for money. At the end of the Seder, the family always leaves each other with a greeting next year in Jerusalem. But the Afikoman, do you know what it is? Have you ever heard of the Afikoman? When I asked that question last week, only one person raised their hand. But it's a very important part of the Passover Seder, and it gives to us an incredible picture of Jesus. That's one of the most treasured memories of every Jewish child, that Afikoman at Passover. You see, every Jewish family has a beautifully decorated white linen bag or similar cloth bag with the Hebrew word matzah embroidered on it. The bag is also called the matzah tash, or unity bag. It has three compartments in it, and a matzah is placed in each one of them. When the hostess sets the Passover Seder, she places the bag on the table next to the Seder leader. Although its origin is shrouded in the dim mist of history, the two most common rabbinic interpretations for this unity bag is that the three matzahs represent either, first, the unity of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or second, the three classes of Jewish people, the priests, the Levites, and the Am Haaretz, that is the people of the land, the ordinary people we would call them, symbolizing that when they're united, they are strong. At a specific time during the Seder service using the Haggadah, the Seder leader takes the middle matzah, remember they're stacked, one on top of another inside this bag, lying flat on the table. He takes the middle matzah from the unity bag and he breaks it in half and then he wraps it in a white linen cloth. Then all the guests at the Passover celebration cover their eyes while the leader goes and hides the broken matzah wrapped in linen that wrapped broken matzah is the afikoman. After the Passover meal is entirely finished, the drama of the afikoman excitement begins. The children are dismissed. The search for the hidden afikoman with its broken matzah. The boy or girl who finds it receives a prize, usually trying to demand a bicycle or some other thing of great desire. Tradition holds that the leader must redeem the afikoman for value. You know, immediately after the Passover, some other things happened. God gave the call to redeem unclean animals with the lamb as well. We find it in Exodus 13. We find it in Exodus 34. Every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. If thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck. That is, if you don't buy it back. And all the firstborn of men among the children shalt thou redeem. Verse 15. And it came to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man, the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all that openeth the matrix, being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. 
They had to sacrifice the firstborn of every animal. But the firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. God doesn't accept the sacrifice of an ass. If thou wilt redeem him not, then thou shalt break his neck. All the firstborn of thy son shalt thou redeem, and none shall appear before me empty. An unclean animal, the ass. We as unclean Gentiles are portrayed here as needing likewise to be redeemed by the lamb. But in the case of the Afikoman, the leader usually gives them some money, just like some of the redemption prices paid in the Old Testament at later periods in the biblical account, when something was given to the Lord and then was bought back by the owner. For example, in Leviticus chapter 27, and if he that sanctified it will redeem his house, he's given his house to the Lord, then he shall add the fifth part of the money to thy estimation unto it, and it shall be his. He could buy it back, but he had to add 20%. By the way, did you know that the tithe in the Bible is not merely 10%? It was 10% the first year, 20% the second year, 30% the third year, and then went back to 10%. It averaged out at 20%. Verse 19, and if he had that sanctified the field. So here he's given his field to the Lord. In any wise will redeem it. That is, he wants to buy it back. Redemption is buying something. Then he shall add the fifth part of the money of thy estimation unto it, and it shall be assured unto him. Numbers chapter 18, verse 16. And those that are to be redeemed from a month old, thou shalt redeem according to thine estimation for the money of five shekels and after the, sh after the shekel of a sanctu sanctuary, which is 20 geras. Interesting. We find redemption with silver in the Old Testament. The New Testament tells us you're redeemed not with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, verily foreordained before the foundation of the world. The reason that the Athikoman is eaten after the entire meal is over is because the rabbis teach that the Athikoman takes the place, takes the place of the paschal sacrifice, that is Pesach. Pesach is Passover. That the Athikoman takes the place of the Passover sacrifice. Therefore, it is the dessert in its sweet taste and significance should last as long as possible. Without the Jews realizing it, the three matzah and the Afikoman unity bag give us a striking symbol of the three persons of the God ahead. The triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Just as the middle matzah is broken and then wrapped and hidden. It was the second person of the Godhead, the middle matzah, that was broken for us, wrapped in his burial shroud and hidden until the entire Passover Sabbath was passed. And then it was the women who went looking for him and found that he had risen from the dead. And then just as Jesus rose from the dead and was seen by many, so the Afikoman is brought back and seen by everyone at the table. Paul reminds us that Jesus himself took that unleavened Passover bread and broke it, fulfilling this symbol. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. When the Afikoman is returned, each guest at the Seder table takes a piece of the Afikoman and eats it for the lingering sweet taste as the last thing that they remember of the Passover meal. The rabbis say that Afikoman means that which comes later, or in other words, to them, a dessert. We know they may know Hebrew, but afikomen comes from a Greek word. Not from Hebrew, it comes from a Greek word. Afikomenos. And afikomenos is in the aorist tense. It means, not that which comes later, it means he has come. 
Do you understand? The aorist tense in Greek expresses what's called, for those of you who are technical people, punctiliar action. That is, it's a point in time event which has continuing consequences. It's aorist. We don't have aorist in English. He has come, a point in time which has continuing impact into the future. To the Jews, the Passover is a reminder that God redeemed them from the bondage of slavery in Egypt without realizing that it is but a graphic and beautiful picture that the Lamb of God has come to redeem them from the bondage of sin. They look back to Exodus, we look back to the cross. There is no question but that the Athikoman is, in fact, a presentation of the gospel that the Messiah of Israel has come. The Messiah, the Lamb of God, has come to redeem his people from their sins and to give them eternal life. Oh, I'd wanted to talk today about that place setting at the Seder table for Elijah. <laughs> I just read the passage a moment ago, but do you know all that's in that? Our time is up. I had thought I could finish this in four messages. But you know, this is something that never grows old. Because it speaks of Jesus. And Jesus has come. And this is the Advent season. Advent means coming. This is when we remember that Jesus has come. That's what Christmas is all about. Jesus has come. And so as we look at Passover, indeed, it is not only a point of thanksgiving. It is a point that the Messiah has come. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you that Jesus has come. A point in time, punctiliar action, once and for all has come and it has continuing effects on us down here today, 2,000 years later. He has come. He has died in our place. He has paid for our sins. He was broken. He was wrapped in the linen burial shroud and hidden for three days. And when they went to find him, he was risen. And he's become the first fruits of them that slept. Whereas in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. He has come. And he is coming again. For this we thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen.